Hello. Um, quick reminder that we have a grand prize giving and quiz and something happening at 4.30 in this room. Um, so please come along. There's a chance to win some really cool prizes. Um, and I'm going to move swiftly on to the next talk. And I would like to welcome Will Woods to the stage. Hello. Can everybody hear me? Is this working? Yes? yes. Cool. Didn't know they were going to give me the big room. I didn't think anybody wanted to know about system upgrades. Because I sure don't. No, wait, I, that's fine. Um, so yes, this is uh, system upgrades, past, present, and future. I'm Will Woods uh, on the installer team at Red Hat. Um, I have the dubious honor of being the guy who has written every upgrade tool. Um, so everything about upgrades that we have done other than what it used to be in the Red Hat Linux days is my fault, and I am sorry. Um, so the one slide version of this talk is here, uh, at least the current state of things. Um, RPM upgrades are kind of terrible. Uh, they've always been bad, but we've, they've been getting better and better and better. Uh, and the current new thing that just landed um, for the last release is DNF system, the DNF system upgrade plugin. And it's really the most sensible way we have um, of handling them. Uh, so, how do system upgrades work? Um, there's two, I mean, basically there's two styles of upgrade that you can do in the Linux world, offline or live. Uh, offline is where the upgrade process runs from outside of your system. Um, this is how, in the olden days, when you would upgrade Red Hat Linux, you would put the new Anaconda CD that you got from cheapbytes.com in your CD-ROM drive, and you'd load that in and reboot into the installer and tell it to upgrade your system. Um, Pre-upgrade and fed up did variants on this. Um, live upgrades are running inside a running system, so you're upgrading sort of out from underneath yourself. Um, this is what apt-get dist upgrade does. This is what yum-based upgrades do. Um, there are pros and cons to both advantages, or pros and cons to both approaches. Um, offline is cool because you can do it without the network. Um, this is important for secure facilities and things like that. Um, and the installer media can handle both installs and upgrades if you've got the upgrade tool on the, in, on the media. Um, and you can download one thing and upgrade a whole bunch of systems with it, which is nice. Um, and plus, this system is offline. This is important if you want to do things like backing it up and, restore, and so you can restore it later, or uh, migrate file systems. You really don't want to migrate from like XC3 to XC4 while your system is running. It's, it's probably messy. Um, on the downside, it's a larger download than necessary, at least for the old way of doing things. Um, you have to download a, an entire CD or DVD to do the upgrade. Media is really slow. And once you're finished, you know, you've just installed from the, the thing, so you have to install all of the updates after you um, finish with the upgrade. And the really big problem with the upgrades in the old Red Hat Linux days was it was difficult to correctly identify the system to be upgraded which you don't think about when it's just your system, but when people do things like put the, you, you have a system that's you know, in a rack, and the rack is attached to a big box with a thousand disks in it, and you boot the installer, and the installer looks at every one of those 1,000 disks to try and find a version of Red Hat Enterprise Linux to upgrade. That takes a while. It usually picks the wrong one, because there's usually 17 of them in there, and it, there were a lot of bugs about that. Um, anyway. Live system upgrades. People love live system upgrades. It's so nice. You can watch it in progress because it's just on your regular system. You only download the things that you needed for the upgrade. It's one less reboot. Um, you get to apply updates. Um, you can't really migrate your file systems, like I was saying. And when you upgrade things that are running, like when you install new libraries behind a running program, things get really weird and really hard to debug. Because if you try to debug the problem, you're you don't know whether you're going to be looking at the old binary or the new binary, or the old library or the new library. And people don't do upgrades all that often. So every time people will do live upgrades, they're like, yeah, it mostly went fine. I mean, one thing was really weird, but I'm sure it's fine. And they just fix it afterward, and we never know what happened. We never know how to fix it. And so it's always a little unreliable. Sometimes it's a little unreliable, and sometimes it's massively unreliable. It's not a good idea in general. It's unpredictable and sometimes catastrophically bad. Um, so yes, in the olden times, the Anaconda upgrade was the way. This is up until, I think, Fedora 7? Was it, was it, called, was it still Fedora Core at that point? I don't know. Anyway, up until about Fedora 7, you install, you upgraded using Anaconda. Sorry? 
Yeah, but I don't remember where pre-upgrade appeared. Is, but anyway, anyway, before there was pre-upgrade, you just up, uh, upgraded using Anaconda, which is to say you used the installer media. You just, all you gotta do is build, download all five CDs and burn all of them. Um, or you boot the netinst.iso and let it download the packages and hope it downloads everything okay because if it fails to download something, like if one of the mirrors goes down, your upgrade just fails. And then you get to break, uh, fix it. So they suck. Um, there's no updates, it's really bad at finding the root partition. Burnt media is so slow and so unreliable. Um, you know, there's certain brands of CD that won't, that you can burn and then they won't be readable by the CDR that's in this system. Like, but if you get a different brand of CD, it'll read just fine. Like, optical media is incredibly unreliable and it's magical that it works at all. Uh, so a huge portion of the bugs that we would get about upgrades were just basically burn a new CD and try again. And that fixed like 50% of the bugs we got. Um, the, and then the rest were things like, oh, um, you should have used a better mirror. Sorry that your system is now hosed. Um, you, sorry it's broken, you get to keep all the pieces though. Uh, um, so that's not great. So eventually, and I was, in, I was in QA at this point, and I was testing upgrades, so I was hitting all of these things, and I was like, this is really awful. Surely I don't want to burn another CD, and like, just stacks and stacks of CDs that I was burning for every release. It was, it was expensive and time consuming, and I don't like optical media anymore because of it. I have like, <laughs> trauma. Um, so we came up with pre-upgrade, um, which is a weird hybrid sort of thing um, that would do some of the work for you. It, it downloads the install image, the boot and the install images. Like it downloads the, the installer um, runtime image that was in the CD and just down, shoves that into your uh, boot directory um, and it downloads all the packages that you need beforehand with the updates, which was nice. And so it just set up your system to boot instead of, next time it booted, instead of booting into the normal system, it would boot into the installer, which was sitting right there in your boot partition, and reboot and just do the upgrade. This was nice, because you didn't have to like click through and have it find your disk for you. Um, well, wait, yes, you don't have to have it find your disk, sort of. Um, yeah, you get good things. Um, it also kind of sucks, uh, because you need to save boot images somewhere that the bootloader can handle, which was always slash boot, which meant this is why boot, the boot partition kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger through from, for, uh, I don't know, 17 till, or seven till 17 or something like that. And it kept not being big enough and then you couldn't do upgrades and then we're like, well, we'll just make it bigger. And then everyone's like, but mine's not big enough. And then, sorry, I don't know. Um, there's still no guarantee that the boot images will know how to mount your disks. If you have like a custom, um, well, you have a custom controller, let's say, for your disks. You have something that we don't support. Uh, you won't be able to boot the installer because our kernel doesn't have that. Um, it also made the installer even more complicated than it already was. We had to handle yet another special case of, we're, we're doing not only the special case of doing an upgrade, but the special case of, now we're doing an upgrade that's also somewhat magical, and the packages are all on this target system, which you can find here, probably, unless the disks have moved around, good luck. Um, it also turns out that changing the bootloader is kind of unreliable. Uh, there's like one thing that does it well, and that's when you install a new kernel package, it adds a new entry. That's safe and well tested. Other things can get a little funky, um, and even that every once in a while does not work. So then there was fed up, and fed up was um, an attempt to improve that situation by having a much smaller image that just handled upgrades. We're not gonna use the installer at all. So this meant we got to pull all of the upgrade code out of the installer and throw it away, and instead put it into this tiny little tool that all it did was upgrades, which is a much cleaner way of handling that problem. Um, it was a much smaller image. Uh, you add, we, we could add it just like any other image. We used the new kernel package tool, which is what happens when you upgrade your kernel package. And so we would download the new systems kernel and that image and boot that. So we're starting our, our install process with the brand new kernel and the brand new uh, se Linux policy and brand new tools and all of that, which is a good idea, or I thought it was a good idea. Um, so then, and we, we, boot in, we boot that, and then we let your existing system set up the disks like it normally does. So we can't predict what sort of weird and crazy things you have done with your disk, which is one of the problems with pre-upgrade. When you're outside the system, and you're looking at it, and trying to figure out, like, how, how do you have slash var mounted? 
you could look in Etsy FS tab, but now there's things like mount units, or maybe you're mounting slash var in, I don't know, in a knit script somewhere, an rc.local type of thing. You could do all sorts of crazy things, and people do all kinds of crazy things, and it's very hard from the outside to look into a system and tell exactly how it wants to set up its disks. So one of the things that FedEx decided was, let's not do that. Let's let the system set up its own disks, and then we'll just run the upgrade afterward, which is a solid idea, or so I thought. Um, it almost didn't suck. Um, so the upgrade.image is the 20 bag. It's like 97% the same as the regular initRD. It's just also got the upgrade code in it. But because of reasons, um, we couldn't have it be just one unified image. Uh, I think it pushed things over the limit on certain PPC systems to have everything in there. Uh, so uh, it was, it turned out this way and that was a problem. Not a big problem, small problem. The generic in RD can't always set up your system correctly is, no, is a more important thing. It turns out that there's some stuff that's in your system that when you build uh, an NIDRD, when, when, you're, you know, when you install a kernel, it looks at your system and sets up an, an NIDRD that will set your system up again. It's using some stuff from your system to do that. In theory, it could do that with um, things in your boot arguments. And so all we need were the same boot arguments, and we could set up your system the same way. If we have the same, in theory, boot arguments and the same drivers, then we can set up your system the same way you do. That turns out not to work. There's a lot of things that require, like a config file that it crams into a NIDRD that we didn't know about. Uh, MD Adam is one of these things. Um, sometimes LVM does this stuff. So various disk things that we don't necessarily support, but third parties handle. We won't have that in our NIDRD, and so and we get a whole mess of, hey, my system doesn't set up bugs, and yeah. So that's a problem. You could work around it, and gradually we were figuring these things out. Um, you know, when a whole bunch of people were like, my MD Atom, uh, uh, my MD RAID array does not work, we figured out, oh, we need that MD RAID, all right, we pull in mdatom.conf, and then there was another, oh, my keyboard doesn't work, so I can't unlock my disk. Oh, well, we'll pull in the vconsole.conf or whatever you use these days to do that. And we kept having to put more and more stuff from your system into the NRD for you, and it turned out we were reinventing a whole bunch of Drake it, but like differently and not well, which is not cool. Um, it also, as it turns out, if you switch from the initRD, which is new, to your system, which isn't, you know, you're running, we have new system D here, and then old system D here, and then we go back to the new system D to run your upgrade. That sounds like maybe, it, no, it's not a good idea. It's a very bad idea, as it turns out. Um, and it would break system D in various ways, because when, when you do the switch from one route to the next route, system D serializes its state and crams it into the new system D. And this works fine if you're going from an old version to a new version. They support upgrades as well they should. Um, doing it backwards where you're sending old stuff, well, no, I got, I got that backwards. Yeah, sending, having an older version send things to a newer version, yes, the newer version understands the older version of the serialization format. It does not work the other way, where you're sending brand new stuff that the old one does not understand. It gets very strange. So it would break systemd in various incredibly hard to understand ways that I would spend several months every Fedora release debugging for, what was it, two or three releases that we did fed up, I think? Yeah, sorry that happened. It, I, it seemed like a really good idea, and then, and then I spent like two months of every release chasing very deep bugs inside of System D that would turn out to be like things that would crash in the middle of other things. I, I ended up sending up patches upstream for uh, LibSE Linux, and um, which is weird to send things to the NSA, but that's fun. Um, and uh, System D and a couple of other things, and this kept having to happen, and they're really hard to understand. And Finally, I started asking for help from, from uh, Leonard and the System D team, and they were, and they said, "Wait, what are you doing exactly?" And I'm like, "Oh no, it's fine. It's totally reasonable. Um, <laughs> we we start a new version of System D, and then we have it, you know, go to an old version of System D, and then and they kind of are like, "No, we're not. We're not doing that. that that's a terrible idea. Don't do that." And so um, there's other problems. I mean, it was also Python 2 only, and it used yum and not DNF, and we kind of want to use DNF, and it didn't always boot your system correctly. But the system D thing is really the killer. Um, wholly unsupported, Leonard did not like it, and he was like, well, you know, we do have a facility in system D for doing updates, 
like the system updates thing when you boot. Why don't you just use that? And on the one hand, I'm like, I don't, does that, does that actually handle the problem? But on the other hand, now it's Leonard's problem. <laughs> so that's obviously the right answer. Um, <laughs> so DNF system upgrade. This is my attempt to basically make upgrades somebody else's problem entirely. Um, so it's a plugin for DNF um, that basically just does the equivalent of DNF upgrade, dash dash release for 23, and then offline. The offline is the part that wasn't implemented in system D or in um, DNF yet. So I, that's like half of what the plugin does is handle that. Um, system D does that offline part for us. DNF does all of the downloading and the depth solving and all of that. And everything is pretty fine. Uh, it's Python 3, it's a DNF plugin, it doesn't, it uses your old kernel in NRD, which is, as it turns out, works just fine. Um, there, there's rarely so much of a difference in the kernel that we really need that to be able to run the upgrade. Um, there's nothing that's, generally there's nothing that's going to run during the upgrade that will require a newer kernel. Um, yeah, and of course it's, you know, on GitHub, it's on all of your systems if you're using, um, if you're using Fedora. Um, the one thing that you lose in that is the possibility, the, the part where you're running outside, completely outside of the system, so that you can do file system migrations and things like that. And so, well, how do we handle that? We've already done that before. Um, when we had to do the user move thing, there's a Drakeit module called ConvertFS. And ConvertFS runs basically the first time you boot something that has the module in it. It looks at your system and it says, oh, your system is set up the old way, I'm gonna convert it to the new way. It does a migration and then it reboots. So. The migration happens, instead of happening during the upgrade or before the upgrade, it happens the first boot after the upgrade. But it still happens, it's still totally possible to do that. Um, so we haven't really lost anything. It almost doesn't suck. Um, there are three main kinds of problems that we see with this style of upgrade. There's DNF bugs where like, DNF doesn't necessarily, or has been doing a little bit weird things with Unicode, um, and so if the plugins did something else with Unicode and Python and Unicode, and you know how that, and explosions everywhere. Um, there's some limitations to DNF plugins. Uh, the reason you have to do dash dash release ver is that that's, that's a DNF argument. There's no way for a plugin to override that from inside the plugin. Uh, it has to be done, come from outside the plugin. And so there's various things that have to be done that can't be done by the plugin that you have to pass in from the outside. And that's something that could be fixed in DNF if it was worth it, but that particular use case, I don't know. Most of what's a problem with upgrades is the same thing that's always been a problem with upgrades. It's everything with RPM. Um, and I don't mean to pick on RPM here, it's just, it's not, a system upgrade is not really what RPM was designed for. RPM, RPM is very, very good at the case it's mostly designed for, which is when you have a running system and you want to install a small amount of updates. Um, it does this fairly quickly, it does this very securely, it's easy to get them, it's easy to deal with them. This is what it was for, for the system administrators to install updates. Um, when you're doing the entire system all at once, it does not scale well. It's an insane amount of disk I.O. to do this. Um, I think we end up hashing every file on your file system twice, maybe three times, because we have to check that it's the right one beforehand, and then, we do, and then you do the install, and then you check again um, to make sure it installed correctly, and then you delete the old one, and so we, we MD5 your, some, your entire file system twice during an upgrade. Sorry. Um, and so the disk requirements are also a pain. You have to download the entire set of things you need before you can start the upgrade. And you have to unpack them as you go, so there's some overhead there that we don't know about. And then there's the case that the scriptlets are unpredictable. There are quite a few bugs where we, we, we have to guess how much disk space you actually need to do the upgrade because we really have no way of knowing. Um, because we cannot predict how much disk space a scriptlet will use. It's just not predictable. Could be nothing, could be 20 meg. Good packages will do things like have ghost files that take up approximately the amount of space they expect to use, but the kernel is the only one I know of that does this. So we have no way of knowing how much disk a scriptlet is gonna use. I, I lie to the, to, to the user and tell them, you know, it requires, RPM says it requires X amount, I pad that a bit, and so if you don't have enough, I tell you that it's not gonna work. Um, that still doesn't work sometimes. People still run out of disk in the middle of the upgrade and it's very bad. You also have no idea how long it'll take. You have no idea what, whether it's doing things when it's in a scriptlet. It's, it's a mess. Um, and so upgrades are not updates is the other main 
problem here. Um, the user expectation of what's going to happen after an upgrade is very different. Um, you expect large changes and you expect there to be new code. So you, you're, will, you're accepting some risk in doing a major version system upgrade. Um, and you do expect it to take a long time, but you're, because you're accepting some risk, you're also a little nervous about it. So you want to know what's going on with it a little more than you do with a regular system update. Updates are usually pretty quick, and usually you can just walk away and get a cup of coffee and you get, come back, it's done. If you're doing a system upgrade, you don't know how many coffees you need. It might be a whole meal. It, you know, maybe it's a, I don't know. So if you come back and it still looks like it's working, so there's the macro scale of it's going to be a long time and you need progress to see how, how many meals you can eat before it's done. But you also, when you come back to check on it, we need some micro scale progress to be like, wait, is it still doing stuff? And if there isn't something spinning on screen or some assurance that the system is doing some sort of thing, people get nervous. So like, uh, I'd say 20% of the bugs we get about system upgrades are people who got nervous and reset their system in the middle of an upgrade. Um, and then they're like, my system won't boot. And that's, and uh, you know, we talk, look at the bug for a while, can you send me your logs, and then it turns out, oh, you, you reset in the middle of the upgrade. And they're like, no, no, it, it crashed, so uh, I had to power cycle it. I'm like, no, it, it, it didn't, honey, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, mm, mm, bless your heart. Oh, yes. Yeah, there's a, yeah, there was another bug where it, it attempts to blank the screen for you, and um, there's a kernel bug where if you're, if you're trying to blank a text console, it doesn't quite, and there's scrolling going on, it doesn't quite do it right, uh, and you end up with like letters kind of crawling up the screen, and it looks really weird. Um, all you gotta do is touch any key on the, on the keyboard, and the screen will you know, go back to normal. Um, but this made people really nervous, and they're like, it's obviously crashing right now, and fire is about to start shooting out of my computer, and they power cycle it, and then they ruined their system. Um, so you have to like, the experience of doing a major version system upgrade is a risky operation, and people are nervous about it, understandably, and we have to do better at letting them know that you know, everything is okay, and here, we can't tell you how long it's gonna take, but we can tell you how far we are into the process. So this is one of the things that um, DNF system, the, the DNF plugin doesn't quite handle, and obviously there's no good, but this is, this is the part where we're getting towards, um, towards the what else could we be doing where it may turn into a discussion sort of thing? Because I have no plans to continue to maintain the plugin myself. Um, it's, it's like honestly 300 lines of code and it's a DNF plugin. Um, so somebody else could definitely handle it. Um, but there's a lot of other stuff that needs to be done around it. Uh, but at the, at the heart of the, the matter, it's a large RPM transaction. Like this is, I've been doing, I've been responsible for upgrades for a very, very long time. And the major lesson that I have learned is it's really just a big RPM transaction. So there you go, that's the entire thing. Um, so there's some lessons to be learned about it, but mostly the lessons I learned were don't be too clever uh, and just let the existing tools handle it because they're the best at it. So the really, this is just the last bits and pieces we need to make the system upgrade experience like tolerable for users. And it's mostly tolerable at this point, especially compared to the old days, but it's still a little nerve wracking. Um, so, yeah, we could be doing better on the UI to sort of let you know that this isn't a regular system update, it's an actual system upgrade. It could look different. Um, we, you know, have a different pulse thing going on, um, a wider progress bar. Unfortunately, um, Plymouth only keeps state, uh, it keeps the, it keeps track of the percentage of completion as an integer. So you literally cannot have more than 100 steps from start to finish. And so if it's you know, gonna take three hours, then that's 180 minutes, so you're only gonna update once every 1.8 minutes. So you need something better than the progress bar, because the progress bar can only tick once every couple of minutes. Um, or we need to fix Plymouth. It's a, you know, your, cho your choice. Um, we could be getting better feedback from RPM or scriptlets. Uh, unfortunately, there isn't a good way to make, our, or I have not come up with a good way to get feedback from scriptlets themselves. We don't have any sort of standard for um, asking for or providing um, progress from RPM scriptlets. Sometimes they output stuff, mostly they don't, mostly they're silent, um, which is a shame because it means that nobody has any idea what they're doing. Um, I think that DNF maybe has a callback for when a scriptlet starts. RPM does. Last I checked, DNF was not handling it. 
So RPM tells us when it starts and stops a scriptlet. That's the best we can do. DNF does not pay attention to those. So that could be better. Um, obviously, it would be nice if we were doing backups before and after. Uh, that's not easy to do automatically for the user until we get everybody on BoaterFS, but then we have like 17 different problems, so I'm not gonna recommend that. Um, but it would be good if, if it was, if you have a system that's capable of doing a snapshot, do a snapshot beforehand, and then if, it, if everything goes totally wrong, restore at the end of it. Um, and we also don't notify the user of any problems. There isn't really a good facility um, in Fedora that I know of for presenting the user with a here's what happened last time you booted screen. Um, if, if you have failures in updates, um, like just a regular system update, you get a notification the next time you log in, um, which we could use that facility, I suppose, but we aren't, and you know that doesn't help for people who are doing like remote upgrades um, and things like that. So it, until there's like a general next time the system administrator is somewhere where I can say hello to him, tell him this facility, I, I, we don't have a good answer for how to tell the user when there were problems, or even if, even warnings about things like, we did not, we installed this thing, but not this thing. Um, we were also de depth solving funnies with DNF that are being shaken out, but mostly, mostly the problem there is not DNF, but RPMs. The, the way that we construct the distribution means that if somebody messes up one of their dependencies, then DNF, which, will, which refuses, one of the major differences between, for those of you who don't know, between uh, yum and DNF, and for that matter, RPM by itself and DNF, is that DNF refuses absolutely to break dependencies on your system, which, from a, um, which seems like a very good idea. But upgrades traditionally break dependencies on your system, and they break them hard, like on purpose. <laughs> willy-nilly all over the place. Um, because mostly we assume that what we're getting um, when we do upgrades is a well-manicured, depth-solved set of things, and we don't really need to worry about whether or not what your system has and what we're doing here are gonna be friends with each other. Because we're, as I say, it's a different operation than an update. With an update, your system is gonna say 99% the same, except you're gonna put this one little, hey, no, stay alive. Um, you're gonna put this one little thing into the system. So you really do need to make sure that everything, you're not breaking anything else on the system. But when you're dropping an entire bucket of things onto the system and replacing everything, you want to make sure that this chunk is consistent, but the three or 4% of things that are outside of that chunk, maybe you don't need necessarily to double check that. Was, that was the theory in the past. That's not how it works now. Exactly, yes, uh, the comment for those who didn't hear it was that, um, with, especially with third-party packages, we can't guarantee their dependency stuff is up to date with what we're installing on your system. Maybe they haven't rebuilt for Fedora 28 yet or whatever you're installing, so we can just sort of assume that you want Fedora 28 and, it's our, and because you're doing a major version upgrade, you know and have accepted the risk that some things will break. So when we install afterward, you're gonna have some things missing. Um, and you're fine with that because you know that eventually the third parties will get around to updating their thing and you'll update and then it'll work again. That's usually how people go in uh, with their sort of gut feeling about the expectations of the system after the upgrade. But DNF won't do that. Is, is anyone looking at that? Because my experience, you know, I get this all the time from Fedora packages, not from third party packages. And it's generally when Fedora drops either a multi-lib or we deprecate a package, mm -hmm. the old version is still in the system. Correct. Which is never going to be right. Updated. Right. Yeah. There, this problem does exist even within Fedora, and we don't have a really good answer for what to do about it yet. We have some stuff where you know we want people to obsolete packages that are obsolete, um, which seems a little bit silly that we would force you to remove a package just because we're not using it anymore. Um, Right, exactly. Um, I think the, the right way would just be to let DNF remove the packages with, with broken dependencies because that's, it, it, will, it will include that. 
it just it just doesn't accept to break the dependencies, but it, it can automatically remove the packages that have broken dependencies. Right. So. Yeah, there are different policies that we could use. You could say, all right, D, uh, DNF should remove things that aren't um, going to be used. And I think that is one of the, like either allow erasing, I think is the switch you can use that will do that. Um, and then there's, or you can use a, the dash dash best, I think is the, uh, I refuse to install anything unless it's the latest switch. Um, so uh, DNF does provide some switches you can flip to get different behavior out of the upgrade. Um, but there are some things that aren't quite handled yet, and so we need to look into those. Um, so there, then there'd be less or fewer problems. Um, okay. Can I ask, uh, will this state be the same? Like the state uh, where DNF uh, is taking care of all the dependencies? Or uh, do you consider the possibility that there, there will be like a more free policy to do these upgrades? So, uh, Um, I don't know. I think uh, Hans is in the room, so we could talk to him about it, but um, I think that the that DNF's goal of not breaking your uh, dependencies on your system is probably the right thing to do 99% of the time, and whether or not it's the right thing to do during a major version system upgrade is still up for debate. Um, I don't have an answer for that, so. Maybe DNF will do that, maybe they won't. I don't know if it's a good idea or not. Uh, the, obviously the correct answer is, well, everybody should fix their RPMs. That has never happened. <laughs> I'm not gonna hold my breath for that. So uh, until we have some better answers for that, what usually happens is that you try to upgrade and DNF tells you you can't. And usually the right thing to do there is just wait a day and the broken, upgrade, or the broken dependencies for whatever package it was will have been fixed, the updates will be pushed out, and then they'll work. But we don't tell the user that very well. Uh, so they just know that they wanted to upgrade and they can't, and that's it. So if we told them maybe, well, you can't upgrade because usually when there's broken dependencies, that means you need to, somebody, somebody messed up, wait a day, we're sorry, it'll be fixed. But we don't have any way of telling the user that. But, Either of those would work. I do feel like telling the user wait a day because we'll fix it is probably better than letting them than telling them here's a way you could break your system if that's what you really want to do. Um, they should probably have both options, but I don't want that to be the first. Um, that's about it. Um, there's also the crazy go nuts research ideas about what we could be doing for upgrades if we weren't doing RPM or if there was other things going on. There's a million ways we could be doing upgrades but they're well outside the scope of this discussion because we're doing Fedora and RHEL things and those are RPM based. Uh, if, we had other, if we had other things, we could talk about other ideas of how to do upgrades that would, be, that would solve some of the problems that we're talking about here. Um, but that's a much longer talk. Um, this is really the end of my discussion on the matter. Uh, if there's any questions at all, um, Go ahead. I, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but would the uh, DNF system be approached? Do you have a suspicion of how many uh, versions of Fedora you would be able to upgrade in a, at a single time? So um, I th right now, I think we only officially support one. Um, I think there's, it yeah, imminently, you will be able to do um, leap upgrades, as I usually used to call them. Um, so you can go from 21 to 23. There's no, there's no real reason you couldn't do like three or four. Technically, there's no real reason, but the, the further apart they get, the less likely it is that um, the packager will have thought that you're going to do that far a leap. Actually, this is a thing I wanted to say to anybody in the room who is a packager, is that anytime you're messing with your package and its scriptlets, keep in mind that during a major version system upgrade, the previous version of the package might be one, might be any one from the previous two releases. So keep that in mind as you're touching your packages, because that's half of what goes wrong during upgrades. And so if you want to improve the experience for the user, we have to keep in mind that they're going to do system upgrades. There's nothing in the um, Fedora guidelines that I know of that require you to think about this, because there's nothing really that's required to do it. And there, unfortunately, as far as I know, is not a way to detect that you're doing a major version system upgrade. It shouldn't necessarily matter, but it does. So um, that's a thing we could add if it ne was necessary. Yes? 
consider is uh, to make an uh, upgrade to a distro sync rather than an upgrade operation by default because there it are does. Or, or, or package uh, to screw up the upgrade path. Yeah, uh, I think we switched that. I think the original DNF system upgrade plugin did a up, and actually, you're right, my slide says it does an upgrade. It actually does a distro sync operation yeah. rather than an upgrade. Um, there is a switch you can use to tell it to do the opposite of distro sync. I actually don't remember what it's called right now, but it's in the man page, so. Wait, is there a man page? Yeah, there's a man page, sorry. Um, all right, any other questions about upgrades at all? All right, um, oh, sorry. Uh, which one? <laughs> Be more specific about RPM's problems. Uh, why don't you mention like the you know, multiple passes of um, checksum and some of the um, notes that they have um, worked on? I don't know if any of those are actively being worked on. Um, you could talk to folks about it, but um, I'm not aware of any work about those things. Unfortunately, RPM being as um, ancient and wise as it is, it's a little hard to get new things into it. Well, if, they, if they added uh, uh, weak dependencies, then yeah. they're, they're a little Yeah, yeah, we started talking about that, what, like 10 years ago? I mean, <laughs> it's, I'm not saying it's not possible, I'm just saying it's not like easy, and I absolutely understand that the guys who are working on RPM are uh, hesitant to make bold and brash changes, so it's not um, their fault that RPM is what it is. Oh, interesting. All right, well, if you want to know more about RPM, come go to the talk about new features of an RPM. Uh, any other questions? All right, thank you all. Oh, wait, one more. Sorry? Um, I don't, I don't know. I, I think something like Atomic is probably the future of how we do these sorts of things, but uh, I don't like talk, speculating about the future because, you know, like William Gibson never figured out that there would be cell phones. So like there's, like Blade Runner, there's no cell phone. So I'm not gonna bother because I know I'll be wrong. Um, but my guess would be that something like uh, Atomic would be, a, at least it would be a much more painless way to do all of these things, or some of them. One last. Oh, that, that was a different example. I mean, you know, I'm talking, the Neuromancer trilogy, there's no cell phones, no, and, and Blade Runner, there's no cell phones, and yeah. I have a serious question. What's going on with graphical upgrades? I kind of lost track of that. I don't know, and I've been meaning to find, uh, Richard. oh, Richard, do you want to answer this question for me? Anything else? All right, thank you all very much. <laughs>